Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Stephen D. Fiore. He is running for governor of North Carolina as a libertarian. <laughs> Excited to have him on today to tell us about this race and get plugged in to the broader movement. Stephen, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Can you uh, hear me okay? Lima Charlie looking good. Almost as good as on your website. You've got a beautiful politician, gentle smile, pose, mm -hmm. and uh, look, look, with the suit and tie, looking very gubernatorial. You are looking very gubernatorial in in, in this, uh, and, and I, I like it. It's it's good. I'm being a little you know facetious, making fun of you in this. Because oh, no, that's a fun. As a politician, you have <laughs> to have a good sense of humor about yourself. I, uh, yeah. I'm one of those guys. I just happen to like wearing suits and ties. It's a character flaw, uh, but uh, but you know what? People <laughs> like it, and that's cool. You know, it's all about personal choice. How you like to dress is is perfectly fine with me. Well said. Very libertarian of you. So, Stephen, first, what should people know about you and your personal background that's relevant to this race? Well, in North Carolina, um, like many North Carolinians, I wasn't born and raised in North Carolina. I'm originally from New York State. Don't hold that against me. Uh, I grew up in the Adirondack Mountains, um, and I left New York State uh, because there wasn't as much opportunity up there uh, as I wanted. Didn't know it at the it, time. It's because you listen to that country song, Songs About Me. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, but I moved to North Carolina in 2004. Um, and I lived on the Crystal Coast for about a year. And uh, I enjoyed my time there. And um, then in 2005, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I went to UNCC. Uh, and got a, a, a public education in political science and Russian studies. Very useful. And uh, so I've been active in the Libertarian Party really since uh, the Gary Johnson campaign in uh, 2016. Um, there was a gubernatorial candidate in 2008, uh, Mike Munger, and he, he made a lot of sense. And it was my real first introduction to libertarianism. And I was like, wow, this, this guy's making a lot more sense than the other two folks. I really want to know more about this philosophy. And that's when, you know, I discovered the Ron Paul revolution and the Liberty movement. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, and I began my, uh, my metamorphosis from mm. a, uh, a statist caterpillar into a beautiful libertarian <laughs> butterfly. Uh, and I've been, uh, it's, I've been part of the party ever since. And uh, it's fun. It's my hobby. It's my passion. Uh, North, in my humble opinion, which is worth exactly what you're paying for it, uh, the Libertarian Party of North Carolina is probably the best political party <laughs> across the country. And uh, I, that, I've that's been, bad. I've, I've, I've spoken in North Carolina, uh, Libertarian Party events. You definitely have. Uh, a beautiful, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a, a community uh, behind you mm -hmm. in running for office as a libertarian in North Carolina. So what community about is this? very important. And I, I remember when you came to our convention, actually, uh, it was really fun to see you. I had seen you uh, in Adam versus the man earlier. I was kind of a fan. Uh, got my my book. Yes. Yes. Oh, like, beautiful. So so I. I'm trying to keep it on the level, but I'm fanboying a little bit on this. Interview. <laughs> well, now I get to be your fan. So, you know, what, what about this race compelled you to jump in? You know, why governor? You know, what what of your mm -hmm. background qualifies you and, and what appeals you to or what about this this race uh, appealed to you? Yeah. So the the governor's race in North Carolina is one of our ballot access races. So in order for the Libertarian Party of North Carolina to be a legitimate, legally recognized political party in our state, we need two percent of the vote in either the presidential race or uh, the gubernatorial race. And so the Libertarian Party of North Carolina came to me and they said, Steve, you're a good public speaker. You're a good writer. You, you know, you clean up nice. You're that weird guy that likes to wear a suit. Um, we want you to be our standard bearer. Um, and it's really quite an honor. Um, and so that is that is why I'm doing this. But more importantly, and I couldn't have known this back in January, 
but the the feckless nature of our state government particularly in response to the COVID crisis, has upended the lives of hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians. And even, even though one political party or the other has the power to actually benefit the lives of North Carolinians, they're choosing not to. And it's, it's for cynical partisan games. And it, it's, it's not something that I think we as a, a state deserve. The people of North Carolina deserve better. They need another option. They need more choices. They need a different voice. There is a better way to go about this. There's a better way to promote human flourishing and prosperity in our state. And it, it starts it, in a state like North Carolina. It, it kind of has to flow from the top down, at least for the time being. And that is one of my motivations. The, the people of our state deserve to hear something more than what the duopoly proposes. They deserve to hear a message of liberty and human flourishing. Uh, if we are a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, then I believe it is the people's right and duty and obligation to put their best foot forward and make our leaders listen to us and act on our behalf and not on their own behalf. Mm, that's a beautiful segue to what I want to get into next in terms of your message to the people of North Carolina. Looking at your website, Issues Facing North Carolina, uh, you know, it, it seems very moderate. I mean, is that you're talking about uh, education, healthcare, housing and zoning? And I gotta say, the disappointment as a libertarian, reform North Carolina, ABC, the alcoholic beverage control system. Are you, are you trying to tell me the people of North Carolina aren't ready to abolish ABC there. I don't, I don't know how bad it is in North Carolina. Um, well, I will, I will say this. Uh, abolish is a kind of reform, and it is the ideal kind of reform, in my opinion. <laughs> yes. uh, I do yes. prefer privatization. Uh, there is a lot of crony interest in the ABC, though. So, uh, baby steps. I will take the whole is, hog if is, necessary. Is it, is it as bad as I'm remembering that North Carolina... Has like it's all government run liquor mm -hmm. stores like that's it. It's a complete it's a government cartel monopoly on liquor. And, and if you don't live in a state that has this, it's like what? Really? Like, you're like because everywhere else you go, oh yeah, there's liquor stores and they have you know giant selections of wine and everything you could want mm -hmm. and competitive prices and service and you know different levels of stores you can go to with you know quality and and customer service and blah blah blah. And then like New Hampshire does this. And I first experienced this in New Hampshire, in all government-run liquor stores in New Hampshire. And you're like, why do you let this happen? How much do you not value your freedom? And 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 I would hope that that you know, for you, that this is a uh, at least I know it's not the most pressing topic, but kind of a popular one, right? Especially COVID, everybody needs more alcohol to cope right now. Well, the situation is probably more pressing and even worse than you may think. Since COVID, the ABC, which is a government-run cartel, has been weaponized against small business owners. So bars and restaurants and clubs are being forced to shut down. And the government has taken it upon itself to describe some industries and some people's professions as non-essential. But then they don't take that extra step on telling us which of our bills are then non-essential, which of our taxes are then non-essential. And so you will have uh, restaurants that are being forced to operate under you know, restrictions. They can't have so many people in. They're no longer allowed to sell alcohol uh, past 10 o'clock because, as the governor himself has said, Restaurants cannot sell alcohol after 10 o'clock because they then become bars. And we know bars are uh, hotbeds of transmission for COVID, which is very interesting. I didn't realize a, um, a restaurant magically became a bar, which then magically increased the rate of infection risk for, uh, for COVID. Now, I understand why some people are afraid of you know, getting sick. Uh, you know, it's the, the death rate in North Carolina has been flattened. The infection rate seems to have been flattened, uh, yet it's not going down. So the shutdown is being extended indefinitely. 
Uh, and every time the new deadline comes up, it gets extended. But let yeah, me so go back to the ABC one more time. And then uh, the thing is how the ABC is weaponized. It'll go to a bar or a club that says, man, we need to pay the rent. We need to put food on the table. We need to earn a living. And there are people who are in the low risk category and need to make their own decisions, you know, quality of life. And, you know, they want to do what they want to do. So they, they go into it both eyes open. So we want to open up. The ABC says, no, what we're going to do is we're going to take away your liquor license because, you know, that's a punishment we can do for you. Well, if you're a bar or a club, that's all she wrote, man. What are you going to do? Have a club and sell only Coke? Yeah, I, I, this is, I see a part of the bigger, we're going to shut down the economy under COVID, reboot it under new ownership strategy. That, that it's the hollowing out of the middle class and working class in this state and across yep. the country. The, yeah. uh, the, the cronies in Washington pass a trillion dollar spending bill and they give it to the top 500 companies. It's the biggest wealth redistribution we've ever seen. Socialism on steroids. Uh, it's yeah. not to the benefit of the working man and woman or the working family. And both Democrats and Republicans are part and parcel of the same poisonous tree. It's, it's yep. a terrible, terrible situation we find ourselves in. The, the social contract, if you subscribe to that or not, has been completely disregarded by the people in power. And it is their obligation to uphold their end of it. We pay our taxes. We follow the laws. We do the things we need to do the right way, whether you're Republican, Democrat, right, left, libertarian, whatever. But the people in power have no obligation on their end. They, they see no duty of care to the people that you know, with a word, they can upend the lives and livelihoods of millions. It's, well, it's completely unjust and wrong. Said, yeah, we have a system where the people who are entrusted with making the most important decisions face no consequences for being wrong. So speaking of which, before I want to get to your main issues here mm -hmm. and, you know, what the offer you're making to the people of North Carolina is. But first, you, know, you mentioned, uh, you know, some of your analyses or, uh, of the numbers in North Carolina. How much do you trust the numbers in North Carolina for COVID cases and fatalities? Well, with the number of cases, um, I mean, it is what it is. No, the What is a case isn't well defined. So we don't know if a case is simply I was work made me take a test. I came up positive, but I feel great. Or, oh, I just got the sniffles or I went to the hospital with uh, upper respiratory tract infection. They didn't have any tests available. And I was like, ah, we'll just do it COVID. So we get a little bit of an extra, you know, thing. Um, and then you have the death cases and, you know, people die and, you know, a death certificate has to be filled out. Um, we don't have much transparency as far as, oh, this person had COVID, but, you know, they had massive um, thoracic trauma due to a car crash. So we'll mark them as a COVID death. I don't know if that's happening in North Carolina. I read a report that that happened at least once or twice in New York. Um, so I I tend to think that in North Carolina, the numbers are probably probably a bit more transparent just because of the people involved. It's uh, it's more bottom up in the healthcare system. Uh, the the private hospitals in North Carolina kind of have uh, they have a motivation to be transparent about their their reporting. Uh, it's harder to lie to people in North Carolina than New York City. It. It probably is. Now, I could be wrong, but I, I want to be as charitable as possible, right? I, it's easy to straw man your opponents. I'd rather steel man them and then see if I can argue against that point. Now, yep. the numbers are awesome. real. I mean, we can argue, we can quibble about it, but uh, it, the, the curve, as stated, has flattened. Right. The hospitals aren't being overrun. You know, people are passing away and that's a tragedy for them and their families. Um, but there are real obstacles that are, have been put in place to offering greater care to people who are sick. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, we have certificate of need laws in North Carolina. Certificate of need laws are basically if you're a private doctor and you wanna offer some kind of care that maybe the local hospital also offers. But, you know, you want to do the thing where you want to actually post your prices 
at a rate that people can afford because you figured out how to do that, you then have to ask the hospital and the hospital board for permission to provide that care. Um, actually, the Institute of Justice took on a case for a uh, gastroenterologist in one of the cities in North Carolina in Greensboro, Dr. Singh. He wanted to buy an MRI machine to provide $500 MRIs to people who needed them. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an MRI before, but I have to get at least one, to, one a year, uh, and they're expensive. You know, at least 2,000 grand with insurance, maybe 7,000 grand. Somehow the hospitals get paid 20, and you can only get it at, a certain, at certain places. Well, $500 is a lot more affordable than a few grand. You know, that's about the price of a significant car repair, which most people can save up money for. And, you know, usually you don't need more. Oh, it looks like we lost Stephen on his connection. Oh, oh, he's sorry, back. About that. sorry about that. No um, problem. Right so, back to where you were is great. I know, right? But, you know, that $500 is an affordable price. And so he was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to go buy an MRI machine. You know, he's a was an immigrant doctor from India. He's like, you know what? This is America. If I need something to provide my customers a service that they want, I can just buy the piece of equipment, right? Wrong. He had oh. to go to the cartel, ask for their permission. And let me just, I'll posit this question to your audience. If you're going to go to your hospital and say, hey, listen, I know you're selling these things for 20 grand a pop, but I want to sell them for $500 a pop. Can I have permission to, com uh, to compete in your territorial uh, monopoly area? What do you think they're going to say? <clears throat> well, they're going to say you're dangerous and it's unsafe to have unregulated people outside of a hospital without permission doing it. Hey, I get it. Oh, my God. It's insane. Mm -hmm. hey, so I want, I want to, just to the bigger picture, I think the ultimate steel man against all of this corona propaganda is that even in the worst case possible scenario that you are credibly presenting, none of it justifies violating individual rights. No. Ever, under any circumstance. Right? Rights are non-negotiable. Yeah. We can and take, as, as individuals and as communities, we can take reasonable measures to ensure our own safety, the safety of our neighbors, and communities can come to agreement on that. You know, it's a lot easier to hold a county commissioner accountable or a mayor accountable or, you know, a local city official, a town commissioner accountable than it is a governor, a senator, a president. Devolution down to the local level gets better results because not every community is the same. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's the biggest metropolitan area in North Carolina. Our issues are different than Carteret County, which is a county in the Outer Banks, which is quite rural and one of the poorest uh, one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. Not every county and not every community within a county is the same. And so people might choose different routes to promote their own economic well-being and their own and the safety of their of the people who live there. And they are, in my opinion, best situated to make that decision. Right now we have a top-down, one-size-fits-all approach. We have people in government who want to be your mother and father and tell you what to do. To use a Larry Sharp line, I don't want to be your mother. I don't want to be your father. I want to be your brother, your uncle. I'm not going to live with you, but I'll drive you to the airport if you need it. I'm there to help you. But, you know, you can make your own decisions for yourself. All right. So, Stephen, your three big issues other than ABC reform on your website are education, healthcare, and then housing and zoning. And for each, I would like you to at least quickly give us why this is important for your campaign to address and what is your message to North Carolina. So if you would please education first. Yeah, so education is very important. In the North Carolina state constitution, the state government actually has a mandated obligation to provide education opportunities to the people of North Carolina. It's right there in our state constitution. So the state government has to do something by its own you know, constitution to promote education. Now, currently we have a kind of mixed structure. We have really good homeschooling laws. We have uh, charter schools and the opportunity scholarship. And then we have school boards uh, that uh, oversee public schools in North Carolina. Now, the public schools in many areas are 
and maybe not the best. And a lot of folks, at least where I live, uh, they're advocating all kinds of different opportunities to improve the kind of educational access that they want, whether it's Montessori, charter, private, parochial, um, school of choice. So for example, you live in a, in a zip code and your school ain't so good, but the zip code next over, the school district next over, that's a better school. So you want to send your kid there. Why shouldn't you have that option? And I'm a big believer in the more options. All right, we lost him again for a second. He stood ahead of the interview that his camera does that randomly. Oh, it's a camera issue. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll get him back we'll up as soon as. Right yeah. yeah. And then, uh, then we can always cut these out for post production. While we're all live, though, I'll just dance for you with my eyebrows. Uh, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. The uh, I didn't think the mic would cut out that time. That's very strange. No worries. Please, right back to where you were. Yeah, yeah. So the the more options, the better, in my opinion. And I, right now, you have the 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 uh, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. They kind of tell everyone what they have to do. Uh, I'm of the opinion that local school boards, which are elected officials, are best situated to make those decisions for the different counties. Gaston County is different from Mecklenburg County, which is different from Dare County, which is different from Cherokee County, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, the state can offer uh, more options, uh, increase the cap on charter schools, which people like, uh, increase the, uh, the cap on uh, opportunity scholarships, which people like, make sure that the tax money that you pay in your property taxes for schools follows the child and isn't by default slated to the institution itself. If we have a state obligation to educate the, the people of our state, our, you know, our children, then it should stand to reason that that money that the state takes from us, uh, which is not ideal, but it is what it is, goes to the child themselves, not the institution that would purport to uh, teach our child things that are maybe less useful than we want. And of course, there's other opportunities for vocational education. You know, uh, again, like I live in a big metropolitan area that before COVID was in the midst of a labor shortage, a labor shortage of skilled labor because of a housing boom that's been going on uh, for a couple years. We need more electricians. We need more plumbers. We need more tradesmen and carpenters. And so more opportunities for people to get that kind of education so that they can get into gainful employment. You know, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. And uh, I firmly believe that local communities are best situated, best suited to make those choices. And the individuals and families should be empowered to make the choices for themselves and their children. All right. Healthcare. Yeah. So, again, I touched on CON laws, and that's the real big one. CON laws prevent good quality uh, healthcare options from being provided at a price that people can afford in North Carolina. You know, we have the Institute of Justice uh, suing the state of North Carolina for its uh, CON laws, the, con the Certificate of Need laws. It goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, it takes years and years to do it, the Supreme Court of North Carolina, I mean. Uh, these are lawyers employed by the state with your taxpayer money to protect the health care cartel so that your health care costs stay high. The innovation in the healthcare space is prevented. And it's not like these doctors are just people off the street. It's This is not Dr. Nick from The Simpsons. These are people <laughs> that had to go to school, are, are accredited. They are good physicians. And we need more opportunity to have that kind of creative solution so that people don't have to, you know, spend an arm and a leg to get any kind of useful health care. You know? All right. Housing and zoning. Not yes. a typical issue you hear from a gubernatorial candidate. Why is this an no. issue? In so it, 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 is, it is kind of a, a, an issue. So right now, uh, North Carolina, if, if we're going to get into some of the political weeds, you know, states usually are either home rule or Dillon rule states, basically meaning if it's home rule, local communities have greater say about what choices and changes and ordinances they can pass. And in a Dillon rule state, basically what the state government says goes, and that goes throughout everything. So North Carolina operates in such a way where when it's convenient for the people in power, it's home rule, sort of. When it's convenient for the people in power, it's what Raleigh says. Raleigh's the, the state capital. And 
in that way, local communities always have to look over their shoulder. If, for example, Charlotte says, hey, we have an idea for um, changing the zoning ordinances to make it easier to build housing in places where people need it because we have a housing shortage here, uh, they have to make sure that whatever they craft doesn't annoy or make angry the people in power in Raleigh, in Wake County, same thing. And so you, you have local people who maybe say, hey, here's a situation in our local community. We can do this, make it easier to do that, empower people to uh, provide these kinds of housing or uh, business zoning that they want uh, without, without worry, because the right now the state government, if the state government decides it doesn't like what you're doing, they can come in and they can just say, nope, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And then they, they tack on whatever else they want. Uh, housing and zoning is important because local communities need to be empowered to be able to choose how they want to do it. You know, there are some cities in this country that don't have zoning laws at all. I think Dallas is one of them, right? And housing costs are Houston. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, are lower than most of the other cities in the country. Why can't we have that in some of the cities and towns in North Carolina? Well, I'll tell you why we can't have that. <laughs> Because the state government won't allow it. Well, yep. again, I'm about devolving power down to the local level as much as possible because then you get better solutions for the people who want them. All right, Stephen, what's the opposition like in this race? So the opposition is the current governor, Roy Cooper. Um, he's a, an old school business Democrat and you know, never let a crisis go to waste. So the the war on small businesses is essentially being you know spearheaded by Roy Cooper as he's using his uh, executive orders to shut down businesses uh, across the state now there's an argument to say that that's unconstitutional that the governor of North Carolina doesn't have that power so you would think that the republicans for example the lieutenant governor is a republican and the legislature is majority republican you would think the Republicans would say, hey, we have the power to pass legislation in a state, by the way, where the legislature is the most powerful branch of government, not the executive. But for some strange reason. Wait, they wait, just, wait. Are you telling me that Republicans are just as criminal as I Democrats know. and they Isn't don't care that, about the constitution of the country or the states within it when it comes to restraining government power? I'm shocked. Are you, is this? Can't be. It's like we're living in, you know, the mirror world of Alice in Wonderland. Every, it's, everything's upside down, right? I mean, how how could that be the case? Well, and okay. the question the question is, why isn't, for example, the current lieutenant governor who is running to be governor has the power to really force the state to not keep people in destitution? Why why wouldn't he use that power? To give people the opportunity to earn a living. Well, maybe well, he wants to use that power in the future. I don't know. Shocking, right? Well, hey, uh, you, we're going to have to send out an invite for your uh, the, the governor and lieutenant governor of North Carolina to come on the show and uh, subject themselves to the same friendly scrutiny. Absolutely. And uh, see how they measure up to you policy wise. Uh, I'm not optimistic, but we'll make sure that uh, Marcus at least gets him an email. And if, you, if there's anything you can do to encourage them to to come on Adam versus the man, I'd, I'd love I'd love to I'd love to see the difference here. See if they're see see if they're if they're willing to come on. Uh, yeah, but see, there's also I believe a Constitution Party candidate too. I'm not oh, as yeah, familiar right. with them, so you might be able to get them as well. Possible. All right, more, certainly more likely. Stephen, it's been a lot of fun talking. You really appreciate what Absolutely. you're doing in North Carolina. Uh, any last thoughts? Of course, your website, Stephen for North Carolina.com. Everybody, at least please go check that out. Give him a follow, a like, a subscribe. You know, give, I think he's worthy of at least that support. If you can donate, if you want to see his voice elevated in this race in, in North Carolina, please throw him some money. Uh, I think this one looks like a, a very worthwhile investment for the libertarian movement. Stephen, you look like uh, you're doing great work. You got a great message and, and a great opportunity with this campaign. Absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity. 
If you can throw any kind of money, any of your viewers, uh, $5, the price of a cup of coffee, uh, this is an important race for the Libertarian Party of North Carolina. We do require ballot access, at least at the local level. Our party is doing great work in promoting good, useful, and beneficial policies that are significantly improving the lives of people in our local communities. And we need in it, we need our party status in order to be able to continue to do that and to help the people of our state and to introduce a better kind of politics in the state of North Carolina. So please go to stephenfornorthcarolina.com. Check me out on social media at Steve4, that's the number four, gov. Um, like, share, subscribe, comment. Uh, this is a grassroots campaign. You know, it's uh, we're going up against the big two. It's a heavy lift, but 2020 is a strange year. And I think we have a real big opportunity to make a significant and beneficial difference in the people, not just of North Carolina, but across the country. We need, we need more hope. Absolutely. Well said, Stephen. Thank you for being a part of that positive force for change with the Libertarian Party. We wish you the best of luck in your campaign. Thank you All so right. much.